Shangshan was the first uh, the name of the Western Tibet, which was uh, some sort of independent land. Uh, the center of this uh, land was uh, the mountain now called Kailash, and it used to be called Tise. The royal Tibetan name for this uh, is Tise. And uh, Kailash of the mountain name, and also Brahma put that all this later 19th, early 20th century Indians giving to Tibetan places. So uh, as a Tibetan, we, I always find it rather uh, unpleasant, in fact, to, to see uh, why these names are given to the Tibetan places rather than Tibet, use the Tibetan names because they, we are dealing with the Tibetan places and the Tibetan names. Anyway, Shangshan was an independent country and this was uh, invaded by the Tibetans from central Tibet, which, which is now the, uh, for example, Tsam and the Gui Tsam, this area, the central Tibet. And now it is the autonomous region of Tibet. And this uh, now we can date uh, in this, uh, the invasion of Tibet goes back to the seventh century by the king from Zigampu. And uh, this is a historical event. Uh, it is uh, recorded in the Duhong annuals. And therefore, it is not just fiction. I mean, it is uh, historical. And now the, 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 uh, the question of why the Shanshan is so important in culture, Tibetan culture, and particularly the Bon culture, is another, another question. Uh, as Buddhism spread from India to Tibet, uh, Tibetan culture became India, Indianized to some extent, using a lot of Indian ideas, Indian concepts, and so on. And, uh, so that shows the origin of Buddhism of Tibet going back to India and so on. So, so the, before this uh, Buddhist, Buddhism established in Tibet, there was a religion or there was a faith. And this was the Bon. And the Bon was, uh, uh, shall we say, extremely important, uh, some kind of a native, uh, native uh, belief. And so, from this context and from this perspective, Shangshan became extremely important for the Pun religious tradition to show that the Pun has another origin, not Indian, but another place going back to, to this uh, Shangshan uh, place. Uh, this is uh, now around the mountain Kalash. And uh, in opposition to uh, Buddhist uh, tracing back uh, their religion back to uh, Bodhya, uh, to India. So and there is also a question of the Shangshun language, which we don't know much, but now the uh, scholars begin to study. Uh, popular of the Shangshun language. And in this, Professor Naganobu has uh, played an important role uh, in opening up the study of Shangshun. It is a language, it is culture, and uh, particularly he developed uh, this theme in Tise e, which is the book that he published. And this is the later Donatella Rossi uh, translated into English, so it is now accessible to uh, non-Tibetans, uh, and also his studies of this Shangshun is extremely uh, important, uh, very highly uh, respected by the Tibetans in Tibet itself, uh, much more than in India itself. And uh, thanks to his taking up uh, the Pun studies, uh, Buddhism, Buddhists, Tibetan Buddhists begin to wonder whether they should also imitate uh, Professor Nanganapu's approach uh, 
which is very important because the Prabhupada Sanaka Nobu has somehow opened up the road for uh, the uh, non sectarian ideas, non sectarian development, and non sectarian approach, and so on. This was something that existed in the debate, but never took really form uh, properly. But Nakanupu, Professor Nakanupu has taken up that theme and it has become extremely important for the Tibetans in India and for the Tibetans in Tibet itself. This book, of course, is a really very important, uh, important book in uh, recent uh, research on the Shangshun and the Tibet. And uh, I think there are two uh, reasons we can, uh, I can say. One is uh, because the Shangshun and the uh, Kalash area was the really very important uh, center for the ancient civilization. That's, uh, and uh, uh, in Tibet, lots of uh, documents come from um, uh, Buddhist uh, historians. So the uh, <coughs> they study and they are describing only the history uh, after um, the introduction of the Buddhism. Uh, before that, uh, we can't see l lots of uh, uh, records from the, the Buddhist uh, or the book, books of the Buddhist uh, historians. Um, so th this uh, this book really has, uh, has a really very very good uh, uh, research on that. Secondly, also in Tibet, Bon and Buddhism are two traditions in in Tibet for already one thousand and three hundred years. But because of a conflict between Bon and uh, um, Buddhism, in Tibet, among Tibetan, there is a problem between two, uh, this kind of uh, uh, religion. And many people, especially some very, really sectarian people, they have a problem of, uh, how can I say, uh, between the problem, uh, between the people who uh, believe in Buddhism and uh, Bombo. Uh, <clears throat> but this book, when, when after the, uh, coming out the, this book in Tibet, many people reading the, this book, and uh, because he is a very uh, important scholar, he is also a Buddhist scholar, so m uh, in, in Tibet, especially new generation, they believe very much in his study. And, uh, um, uh, how can I say, for the, for the young people, this, uh, more and more accepting that uh, Bon tradition and Shangshun is very important for, t for Tibet. Also, uh, less, uh, how can I say, uh, sectarian people, many people, they uh, think that Bon tradition and Shangshun tradition is more impor important for, for Tibet, uh, Tibetan culture. That's why for these two reasons, I think this is a really great achievement in Tibetan studies. I think Chonungkor centralized uh, um, really, uh, this is uh, the area of Kalash, we say, also included Chonungkor. This is, uh, was a center of uh, Himalayan civilization in very ancient time, I think. Um, from that area originated uh, the Bon religion, and uh, in Tibetan tradition we say, Sipajiji uh, Bun. This is the original uh, origin from this place, and uh, this is uh, wa was a uh, center for uh, ancient civilization of uh, Himalayan area, and from that place uh, spread the, co the culture to uh, south and uh, east and north. So. Even uh, some traditions from that place, they went to in India. For example, um, uh, Jainism and uh, uh, Shivaism. Uh, this kind of uh, very old tradition in India also, their, tr their origin uh, can be traced to uh, Kalash. That means there's a connection very clearly for uh, for us that uh, uh, for this reason from that that place to east and uh, even to uh, west 
the, this uh, the kind of uh, central of a uh, very ancient uh, uh, culture and then spread, uh, spread from that one everywhere. So that's why the uh, similar, uh, that's um, Kalish area is very important for Tibetan culture. We are beginning to see a lot more evidence and, and ways in which that evidence makes useful and interesting patterns and that's given us a possibility of, of really doing what uh, Namco Nilga Rinpoche wanted to do I think and, and still wants to do which is to uh, to see um, Tibetan culture as something that really has its own integrity and history and, and identity which is which is quite separate from the uh, from what came in from India and obviously what came in from India was massively important and influential and so were the connections with a less, slightly lesser scale with China and perhaps with Central Asia but, uh, but the, the Tibetans have their own history, it went back a long time before the arrival of Buddhism and we're beginning now to get a, a bit of a sense of what it is. Yeah, it seems to me a great pity that um, uh, a lot of the archaeological activity that's been carried out in that part of the world has focused on a much later period, uh, that is to say the period of the 10th and the 11th century. Um, of course the area, as you know, is um, important for at least two main reasons. Uh, on the one hand you have the Shangzhong uh, tradition mm -hmm. and on the, uh, the other hand uh, this is the place where the second diffusion of Buddhism began mm -hmm. uh, with the translator in Chen Zhangpo and mm -hmm. uh, the kings of Western Tibet. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of the emphasis that has been given uh, to research in that area has tended to look rather at the, um, uh, the second phase of diffusion of Buddhism in this area. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, this earlier phase uh, has been largely neglected. Um, I'm thinking particularly of the, uh, some of these sites in the Sutlej Valley, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, um, it was clearly a cave civilization, similar to the kind of thing that you find in Mustang. And we know from Mustang that these caves were extremely ancient, uh, going back to possibly the second millennium BC. Mm -hmm. Highly likely that this was all part of the same uh, broad civilization. And they were used uh, later on for Buddhist purposes. Mm -hmm. So um, would you see there being some kind of uh, continuity in the traditions uh, between uh, Mustang, which was referred to as Shangzhong Mei, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Lower Shangzhong? Mm -hmm. um, uh, would you regard this as being um, part of uh, a, a similar culture um, that uh, long Mustang predates is, uh, Buddhism, M M Mustang and in and uh, this, uh, Kuge and this area. Exactly. Yeah. I think there is not much doubt for, mm -hmm. for us at least. So mm -hmm. there is a, there is a suddenly relation mm -hmm. in uh, many uh, cases. Mm -hmm. For example, spiritual uh, relationship mm -hmm. and also the people's way of life. Mm -hmm. So we can, nowadays we can clearly see if you visit one of the caves in the Mustang and also visit, if you visit the caves in the Chungnu and this uh, uh, Sud uh, Sudlesh uh, rivers, uh, yeah. the area of caves, mm -hmm. just exactly the uh, similar yeah. structure, similar, in even the way of rock carving, sometimes we can find yeah. they are very close. Yes. So according to the burn tradition, I think we, in our text, mentioned um, Early time, these uh, Shangzhong people mostly they lived in uh, ba, ba means like tent, yes. a wool tent, right. and also they could. Uh, there is uh, some some text describe mm. people living in the uh, caves. Mm -hmm. Ah, I yeah. see. Right. So, uh, so these were not hermits. These were actually people who were living in the caves. No, this can be changed as uh, right. uh, 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 yes. Mark. Uh, yeah, last night, yes, I think there's uh, people change time like winter time and summer time. Yes. Uh, not always necessarily to stay sure. all the uh, all the time. Right, they right. change. Yeah, this was certainly the case yeah. in Mustang, uh, where they actually moved around quite a lot yeah. and used the caves for yes. uh, part of the time, as indeed they still do. Yeah. Then uh, I think uh, one of the important thing is that uh, obviously there is a lot of kind of highlights of the Kuge, mm. uh, the, the kingdom. Uh, which was around anyway around 10th century, yeah. were very strongly flourish, uh, influenced by the Buddhist. Uh, but all this uh, system of this uh, building and ruins, everything is not necessarily exactly that time uh, built. Mm. There can be continuation. This this could be Kuge Kingdom could be built up on the remaining of the early Shangshun yes. uh, 
uh, caves and cities. Which is what makes uh, archaeological investigation all the more important, yes. of course, yes. to try and find yeah. out what's in the, the lower layers. Yes. Yes, until now there have been some wonderful descriptions, as we know from our colleague uh, John Biletza, for instance, who's been in um, through much of Western Tibet and described mainly the surface finds. Yeah. But of course, uh, with that antiquity of uh, civilization, it's clearly necessary to go much further down, and this yes. requires some serious long-term uh, yeah. archaeology. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the other thing that is uh, clearly necessary uh, f uh, from an archaeological point of view um, is that this will probably shed light uh, on the kind of ritual activities that were, uh, were performed in these areas. Um, the more, it seems to me that the more and more research that is done there, uh, the more the Bonpo accounts about the importance of Perm in this area are, uh, um, are vindicated. I'm thinking particularly about uh, certain doubts that people had that uh, there was any perm at all in mm -hmm. Shangzhong, yeah. because all the accounts that we have uh, place perm in Shangzhong at a much later time. These texts are all you know, from the post-11th uh, century period. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the texts that we have found in Dunhuang uh, and also in the, in the, the stupa that Santan Kame was talking mm -hmm. about, uh, these all refer to Perm in central Tibet, uh, mm -hmm. not in western Tibet. But then just recently, uh, this biography of uh, Lalama Yeshe E came out in which there is a, um, a set of edicts mm -hmm. in which he explicitly condemns uh, the practice of Perm traditions and the Tsuklak, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the sciences of Shangzhong. Mm -hmm. um, so um, the more evidence we get, the more it seems to, um, the more it seems to vindicate what the Bonpers have already been saying for, for a long time. There's been a certain amount of work done in, uh, in Western Tibet in terms of archaeology, mm -hmm. uh, and it's already yielded some extremely promising uh, results. Uh, one of the main areas of interest has been uh, Kyunglung Yulkar, mm -hmm. which is reputed to have been uh, the capital of uh, the old um, uh, kingdom of Shangzhong. There are two candidates for that. Uh, there is one so-called Silver Palace, and there is mm -hmm. the other one that uh, our colleague Mark Aldendorfer calls the, the Kyunglung Mesa. Mm -hmm. um, uh, now, in the Pun tradition, which of these two is actually regarded as being more important? In Bund, uh, historical accounts, Cholung uh, is quite of, often mentioned, and this is the regarded as the, in, for some time, the main capital, uh, the palace of the Shangshung. And also, this is the place where uh, Temba Nongo, who was one of the most uh, Bambu uh, Siddhas early time, uh, was uh, born. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, what do you um, think of some of the archaeological finds that have been made there? Um, for example, there seem to be discoveries of uh, palaces, maybe temples, uh, some grave sites, and so on. Uh, do the kinds of discoveries that uh, you've heard about uh, support uh, what's been said in the, the Bonpu literature about uh, Changjun and this area? Mm, I cannot say very clearly, but uh, I think, uh, according to, to the Bonpu historical accounts, uh, there are some description that Chunglung uh, Ulkar and this area being as a very important uh, place. And uh, when in the text describes, there looks like having a very uh, yeah. magnificent uh, palace mm. uh, made out of many different kind of um, precious things uh, like uh, that. So that is uh, what we expect is that even there is not really as to exactly uh, text uh, described, but there should be uh, very, some uh, certain kind of uh, the cities or the yeah. ruins of the trash of the uh, yeah. palaces must be. The Western Tibet is full of remarkable archaeological resources that pertain to the development of Bon, the development of Shangshun, the identification of Shangshun, the attempt to try to understand what Shangshun is really all about. The problem is, of course, that the scale of archaeological research that's been done in the Tibetan Plateau in general is very, very small, such that there's a great deal more speculation than there is empirical data. So I've had the good fortune, though, to be part of a series of projects out in Western Tibet that have tried to, in their own way, begin the process of disentangling things like Bon, 
indigenous religion, shung shung, ethnicity, identity, archaeology, to try to begin to make sense of it because the primary problem has been is that we, we've excavated too few sites and really don't have a way to put these sites as yet into time. So in other words, if you don't understand time and control that effectively, what happens is, is that you could be comparing apples and oranges so easily. And I think that a number of discussions we've had at the conference so far have been that kind of, look at this, doesn't this look like that? That means, therefore, these things are somehow necessarily related. Well, they may be or may, they may not be, but the problem is, is that until you control for time via some kind of archaeological excavation, you really can't make those claims in an effective way. So the, the work I did out in West Tibet was with uh, Sichuan Uni University in, based in Chengdu. Um, I was working with a team of archaeologists from that program, Ho Wei and Li Yongshang, who were my colleagues at the time. And the goal of the research was twofold. One was to, what, the first project was to really look at Piyang Dungar and try to understand the, the evolution of Buddhist um, thinking in that region par as part of the Chidar. I worked for them mapping the site and doing some other excavations for them as well, but I also excavated a site on my own called Dindun, and Dindun became very important because it's the earliest radiocarbon dated site in all of western Tibet right now. And that goes back to about 500 BC and goes down to about 100 AD or so. And the reason why that's important is because it has a number of aspects of both secular as well as religious activity and life at the site that provide us with a few insights into what might be called Changsheng. I, I try to avoid being very clearly definitive about terms like that because I know that I really am not certain whether or not these materials are Changsheng, but they do fall in a time frame that's thought to be Changsheng related. So I've tried to use those materials then from Dindun, including their Do Ring. There is domestic architecture. There is mortuary sites of one kind or another. And what I've tried to do is to construct a very preliminary idea of what Changsheng ethnicity looks like from the ground up. We're not talking about elites here. We're talking about relatively common people. And so I've published some of that material in a variety of areas. And, and it's, it's a start to begin to understand what's going on with what could be, in fact be Changsheng identity. The second major project was to go out to West Tibet and work on a place called Chunglung. And that, of course, is, is a rather contentious term in general. Um, Chunglung was used by Tucci back in the 30s to describe what was called the Silver Castle. And I think that would be called the Chunglung, <laughs> which one is it? The Chunglung Nulkar or Nulkar? Chunglung Nulkar. That's Tucci's Silver Castle. And Near there, about 15 kilometers further up the Sutlej River, that is toward Kailash, is a place that I call Chunglung Mesa, which is also then called Chunglung Nulkar. And on top of this Chunglung Mesa, I use that term so as not to confuse myself with which one of these Chunglungs I'm talking about, what one finds on top of Chunglung Mesa is this extraordinary archaeological site. It has multiple levels, that is, it has a series of three major terraces upon it. It has a very clear defensive wall placed around it. It has evidence of domestic architecture, that is, of relatively simple people living their lives down below, animal corrals, uh, water control and storage features. Uh, at the very tip top of it, it has some very clearly elite architecture, not large. We're not looking at anything that's particularly substantial, but it's clearly different from the domestic architecture that sits down below. Um, the interpretation, of, my interpretation of what Chunglung Mesa is, is that this is very likely to be a major, a major settlement node in western Tibet. Now, I'm very careful about what I mean by the idea of settlement node. Uh, could this be the famous capital of the Shangshung polity? Quite likely it could be. Is it? I can't say that with certainty, but the scale of the site is remarkable. The complexity of the site is remarkable. And the radiocarbon dates that have been obtained from the site, at least the later series of dates, is fairly clear. Uh, it dates to about six, seven, 700 AD or so, maybe a tiny bit earlier, uh, around that era. And so that fits again with our understanding from textual sources about what Shangshung is supposed to be like. Um, the site does show evidence of having been, at least some structures having been burned, whether or not that was via conquest or some mistake of some kind on some bad accident, it's quite unclear. But what's important about the site is to be very, very certain that there's absolutely not a shred of what you would call Buddhist architecture upon that site. 
In other words, everything that's there fits within the model of Shangsheng ethnicity that I was describing that I obtained from the Din Dun site. Uh, perhaps with some changes because it is later in time. But fundamentally, the site is not a, a Buddhist construction. So I feel very comfortable about that. Now, if you go down the valley then past, you know, leave Chunglung Mesa and then go down to the, the silver castle that Tucci discovered, it's fairly clear to me that I've, I've been there now three or four times. I've walked the site. Uh, no excavations that I have done there because we had no permits to do so. But walking the site made it very clear that this is a Buddhist construction. That is, there's a typical range of Buddhist chortons, um, other sorts of ritual structures on the site. It, 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 it is very clearly what the text says it is, is the development of a Buddhist tradition in this area that was identified in textual sources as the Silver Castle. It has all the right kind of, of attributes that you know, should be described in a Buddhist text for this kind of place. There's one other place though on the landscape that I think is really important and I just, I, I'm, I'm hoping that permissions to travel, well travel is no problem but excavation and doing further research is somewhat difficult these days. There's a place that's immediately adjacent to Chung Lung, uh, the, the, the Silver Castle site. It's about 200, 300 meters further downstream and it is this remarkable combination of a village site which is very, very clearly a village site with very typical, what I call Changsheng ethnicity features. It has residential architecture of all different kinds. And it has a truly remarkable ritual complex atop a long spur that comes down from the hills into the valley floor below. And what's fascinating about this is this, this spur has do ring. It has miniature circles of one kind or another with small do ring penetrating from them. It has a whole variety of, of platforms, um, other sorts of evidence of burnings. It's truly unique. I have never seen anything like that in Western Tibet. And so I see that this is something that would be truly remarkable to go back and look at. It has what I'm calling a very large slab altar down below. Uh, it, it is something that could well in fact be the early, the, you know, Shangsheng era, pre-Shangsheng era, um, silver castle that has been described, but not, of, of course, of Buddhist times. So the, the research that needs to be done out there is substantial. That is, to identify more of what Shangsheng might look like, to further go into what the possibilities for Chunglung Mesa are in terms of really helping to identify that as a likely capital of a Shangsheng polity. And then to look at those antecedents that I was describing from the site, certain, slightly down uh, river from the Silver Castle itself. Um, that would be my desire is to go back and work those sites because there's some absolutely tremendous archeology span out there that's just waiting to be excavated.